Good morning, Siobhan Lancaster. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm I'm great, Matt. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Right, uh, some good news. Uh, certainly good news for our uh, listeners, subscribers, etc. You have agreed to uh, help us out on the energy show by providing a little bit of insight. So um, our first, the first bit of insight we're going to need from you is tell us about yourself. What's your background? Sure. Um, so I've worked in the uranium industry on and off for really the last 10 years or so. Um, uh, I started off um, doing uranium exploration in Australia. Um, for a small explorer uh, called New Power, and uh, then went across to extract resources. Of course, they had the HUSAB deposit, which we're going to be talking about in this presentation that I'm going to bring everyone through. And um, and more recently, of course, we listed 92 Energy. Um, so we've been working in the Athabasca Basin um, of Canada uh, there, and we have our Gemini deposit. Well, okay. And um, I think somewhere along the lines, you seem to have worked in three out of the four major jurisdictions we're going to talk about today. Um, sometimes, as an, sometimes as an M&A lawyer, I think you were involved with the uh, HUSAB in some way, shape, or form, weren't you? Yeah, no, look, I was heavily involved in the sale of HUSAB, um, so basically brought the company through the whole process. We um, ran a process with a data room for about two years. Um, and so we dated a lot of people through that process. And of course, we ended up selling HUSAB to CGMPC for $2.2 billion. So probably the last big transaction in uranium. Um, and uh, it's certainly, it's a mine now. So it's now the second largest producing mine in the world which is pretty exciting. Um, so I'm keen to tell you some stories about that and some other uh, interesting bits and pieces along the way. Well, okay. Well, I think we're going to get into it. So we're going to start, sort of, I guess, on the, on, the, on the macro. We're going to have a little bounce around the world, a dance around the world um, today so people understand the jurisdictions, maybe some of the players, some of the assets um, as well. So you're going to kind of run us through a, a deck today and maybe, um, well, why don't you pull that up and, and and we'll kick it off. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask some dumb questions along the way. No, that's absolutely fine. If I can't answer them, that's fine too. Um, but I'm sure we'll we'll have a very good conversation in any case. Good, good, good. Okay, over to you. Great. Well, the first thing that uh, I think is really important for everyone to note is that a huge amount of our uranium production comes from just four countries. So that's Kazakhstan, Australia, Namibia, and Canada. And they're the four countries that I'm going to bring everyone through today. So Kazakhstan, obviously, everyone knows yeah, is 41% of the whole uranium market, followed by Australia at 13%, Namibia at 12%, and Canada at 8%. Normally, Canada is number two. Um, but of course, when, when, when this was done, um, there was some uh, restrictions at MacArthur River and COVID restrictions as well. So... Um, this will change slightly next year uh, with the productions um, coming out of um, MacArthur River. Just this map on the right-hand side just really shows where the known uranium resources are in the world. And you can see the massive blob over Australia. And that actually accounts for um, uh, mainly uh, the Olympic Dam project, which um, produces about 9 million pounds of uranium a year at the moment. And of course, we know is a byproduct from the copper mark copper mine, copper and gold mine. So um, that's a huge resource sitting there in Australia. But of course, we have other great resources as well. And if you do a spin around the world, obviously, Canada's got a lot of resources, Kazakhstan and Russia. Just before, before, you, before you go, obviously, it's, it's kind of interesting. I see it was the Olympic Dam, obviously, a major copper mine and you know, uranium as a byproduct. So I think when, when uranium was uh, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, it's a it's a meaningless byproduct. It was almost sort of dumped into the market, um, you know, sold to traders. Do you think Correct. now with the uranium price kind of creeping up to well, as price was you know as, as of yesterday was seventy three bucks, um, and it kind of feels like it's going to sort of it's stride confidently towards a hundred bucks the side of Christmas um, for, so. from what we can see. Um, do you think that that stops becoming a but it's an unimportant byproduct that's dumped into the market. Maybe there's some you know, consideration as to where that goes, who gets it. Well, I was reading a couple of weeks ago that Olympic Dam's actually now contracting their uranium and it's no longer going to be on the spot market. But I'm not actually sure if I've confirmed that from any source. Do you know whether that's true? I'm not actually I, sure. I, de I definitely read it, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure yeah. if that's uh, got, got over the line. But um yeah, I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see um, yeah. what, what happens there. Yeah, makes sense. But, 
Yeah, I, ho- I hope so. And I think that, you know, the kind of removal of traders um, and all of this kind of mobile inventory, I think people call it, um, from the market will kind of help sort of sta- stabilize price, I hope. Yeah. Um, and all the, and the, and the demand side will obviously be quite keen to actually work out how they get it, where they get it from, and, and maybe contracting will come a little bit more prevalent again before Christmas. We shall see. We shall see. Yeah, well, my right. understanding, sorry, just to interrupt, my understanding is that the two biggest producers in the world, Kazataprom and Cameco, are all sold out. So there's no loose inventory coming out of them into the spot market anytime soon. So, you know, Exciting. If you take Exciting. the out of it, there's Look. not much inventory in the market there, is there? It's good. And what do we like? Scarcity. <laughs> Why do we like it? Price. Get- <laughs> right. Okay. What are we looking at here? What's the space tell us? So this is basically looking at the largest uranium mines in the world. So Cigar Lake, um, obviously at the moment, is the largest uh, uranium producer. Um, that, of course, is in Canada and owned by Cameco. Um, the next mine there is Husa, which is, of course, my um, my baby, I should say. Um, and Husa was owned by Extract. It was sold to um, CGMPC, which is the Chinese state-owned entity, Um, and that's the second largest producer of uranium in the world. Um, It's an open pit mine. Um, You can see Inkai is the third one. That's an ISL mine out of Kazakhstan. Um, And then, of course, Olympic Dam, which we were talking about. So that's obviously the mine that is selling uranium as a byproduct. And then we've got a whole bunch of ISL coming out of um, uh, Australia and Kazakhstan, um, Rossing, of course, is in there. Rossing has been producing uranium for, you know, 40 odd years out of uh, Namibia. And um, of course, that's owned by CNNC, um, who is the other Chinese state owned entity, um, Samir, which is Orano's mine in Nigeria. Um, and then, um, a- and then that's really it. So I guess the reason why I've highlighted um, certain mines here in green is because the significance of that is these mines are all going to run out of ore by the end of the decade, right? What? Wow. Okay. Really, you know, it's something. Uh, so these are four out of the top ten mines are going to be have no more ore by the end of the decade, and they're due for, due for closure. That's pretty serious. Um, I didn't realize that about Cigar Lake. Um, so we see Kamako working hard to replace that with. Um, with, with the rest of their portfolio, maybe even some acquisitions, I, I, I suspect. Um, can I just ask you about this? Um, so, so four of the top ten will will run out. In terms of the, the the kind of projects coming through, which are owned by the big guys, I mean, obviously, uh, Kazatom Prom is kind of restricted in terms of its ability to kind of increase uh-huh. you know, in set of rules they they created themselves. So that twenty percent rule. Um, where where's the, where's this uh, going to come from? Where's this replacement all going to come from by the end? Of the decade, we've, we've heard talk of a few developers to meeting, you know, 2026, 2028 um, production, but it's not going to be enough to kind of fill the gap, is it? Well, I mean, Arrow, obviously, they're looking at bringing on 25 million pounds of uranium a year or 30 million pounds of uranium a year. So, depending on when they start, will have an impact, and that should replace a lot of these pounds. Um, but, um, you know, and then you've got some smaller mines as well. You know, you've got Denison's ISR projects with um, Phoenix. Um, you've got, um, uh, what else have we got? We've got some new starts happening. So, obviously, Langer Heinrich is restarting. You've got Boss restarting. Um, uh, and you've got, who else have we got restarting? I'm missing someone. Peninsula restarting and there's someone else in there that I'm missing. But in any case, there is there is replacement coming through. Um, it's just whether there's going to be enough for increased demand as well at the same time, I think, and whether they're going to start at the right time. So if there's a gap, for example, these all shut down and then there's a gap before some of these new producers come on, that could cause some pretty big problems in the market, I would expect. So you know, the, other, the other thing, that, and I suspect you're going to come on to this, um, is what I'm looking at here with the ISL, ISR project, certainly, um, and also in terms of you know the, the kind of low cost component that they have. The other side of that coin is things like Husab and Rossing and Samar, et cetera. It's low grade African stuff. That's what people position as. It's low grade. It can't possibly contribute towards the demand that we're, we're, we're setting on the supply side. It's not going to be able to kind of contribute towards that kind of demand 
need that we've got, is it? Is it? But it says, what, what this chart says to me is, uh, there's a lot of low-grade mines which seem to be contributing vast sums or a vast percentage of the current wealth supply. Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, big and ugly is beautiful in this game. Um, so, you know, who said, uh, certainly some would say, um, probably if it was owned by someone other than the Chinese, maybe wouldn't have been an operation, um, because of the high and it's at the high end of the cost curve. However, if you're a strategic buyer like China is, and you're just interested, interested in securing those pounds, you don't really care if you're paying a few extra bucks for the pounds to get it out of a mine like this. So. You know, it's quite interesting when you look at this ownership, how many of these companies are actually state-owned companies. Um, you know, Kazataprom is largely owned by the Kazakh. Um, uh, obviously, CNNC and CGMPC are Chinese. Uh, you've got Uranium One in there as well, um, which is the Russian group. Um, and you've got, obviously, Orano, who are the French state-owned entity. So that's... That's a, a lot of ownership by um, by governments within that. Well, it's, it's, it's all it's all strategic in that case, isn't it? You know, people are trying to secure their, their energy supply going yeah. going forward. You know, they need to. They can't think of this in one and two year terms. In fact, they can't even think of it in economic terms. Really, is they they need it or the lights go off. It's, it's as simple as that, isn't it? Yeah. So, what does that what does that say to you in terms of all of this kind of slew of you know uranium juniors coming? coming through, is it inevitable that they're going to fall into the hands of, you know, these strategics, these these government entities? I think it depends where you're located. Um, you know, every every location has different rules around who can own what. Um, uh, so, for example, I would say that the uranium in the US and Canada will remain sort of um, in Western hands, if that makes sense, Western companies, um, whereas some of the mines in Africa might sort of end up more in the hands of Chinese, although how much more, I don't know. Um, you've obviously just seen the Chinese has done a deal with Kazataprom, um, and that's for over fifty percent of their supply. I think I think was the number. Um, haven't seen too many details on it, um, but that's a lot of uranium that they're securing. Um, so they've obviously gone through mine ownership, and now they're going through. Well, we're just going to create whopping big contracts now, and that's all about securing supply for. The number of um, nuclear power plants that they're building, they're basically building more nuclear power plants than the whole world combined. So that's a huge amount of nuclear power plants and a huge amount of fuel that they're going to need to make sure they get their hands on and so that the lights don't go out. You're absolutely right. So, but, but, and here's the other thought I had. Obviously, you know, I think it's long been asserted that, you know, so China is the kind of, you know, the breadbasket, Africa is the breadbasket for, for, for the Chinese. They've been in it certainly as long as I was doing business. There in as far, far back as 2005, the Chinese government and ent government owned entities are in there securing mineral rights, reserves, buying companies, and especially in the case of uranium. You know, we, we've seen that in, in Namibia, certainly. Um, and I, I suspect they're make, making strides into Niger quite soon, too, uh, with, with the French sort of um, being either ousted or, or backing off in their, uh, you know, on their own volition. Um, but it also says to me, development companies in Africa potentially don't necessarily have that concern around capex. When I'm looking at a, an African play, I'm going, well, they probably don't actually need to kind of get to that capex stage because when, when a company goes and raises the kind of capex to get into build phase, there's a kind of, if you look at the SOM curve, there's a kind of slight value destruction for a period of time while it's being built out yeah. and it sort of comes back again just slightly before production um, starts up again. Uh, starts it starts and um and i think may maybe that's an advantage for the african players in, in that sense because it's strategic the capex is irrelevant because the cost of capital for the, the chinese owned entities that that step in is negligible compared to what it would cost someone in the west and the margin too is kind of irrelevant it's how many pounds have you got i so said do, do you kind of see that as a kind of unfair advantage i mean you've, you've sold a 2.2 billion dollar company in africa what do you think? Well, look, I mean, I think big is beautiful for strategic assets, right? Um, and, and that just makes total sense. Um, what I would say, though, is there is a, already a lot of Chinese ownership in Namibia, so it might be capped out. C capped out, capped out by from the Chinese side or from the Namibian government side? Maybe from the Namibian government side, but that's speculation. Right. right. Okay. 
Interesting, interesting. Which would then, I guess, uh, limits my argument somewhat if if that is the case. But uh, it, yeah. if they are allowed to, because I think what I, what I saw around was like working. I've worked in like twenty five countries in Africa. What I, what I saw is that the you see more holistically. You know, so say if um, Chinese did want to buy a uranium company, it would be bundled in with a bunch of other investments and uh, acquisitions at the same time. It's kind of like it was sort of like joined up thinking, which I love about the Chinese, you know, because they're, they're going, right, what's it going to take to get this deal over the line? Oh, we'll build some roads, we'll build a hospital, we'll lend you some money for whatever sovereign wealth fund type structure that you, you want to create. So I, 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 I wouldn't count the Chinese out. If they, if they need it and they want it, they'll, they'll find a way. And well, money they do talks. have ownership. They've got 30% of ownership in Langerhorn, which I don't forget. They've got Rossing. Yep. They've got yep. Rusad. Yep. Yep. Very, very much the energy. I think, well, the Namibian government are trying to position. They've also got offshore oil now in Namibia. So it's getting to be a little bit exciting. It's a little uh, energy hub for it's Africa at the moment. To, it's a great jurisdiction to work in Namibia. I can't talk yep. more highly for any jurisdiction. Um, it's just a fantastic place. It's got a, a really good sort of um, uh, laws around uranium mining and mining and things like that. And, you know, it's 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 much easier to get a mining license there because there's only one jurisdiction that you have to talk with um, than, for example, in in places like Canada, um, because you're dealing with different jurisdictions. You know, you're dealing with federal, then you're dealing with state and etc. You don't have that issue um, in Namibia. So, um, it from that from that respect, it's a it's a great place to do business. I think. Yeah, and also doesn't doesn't have that kind of slight overlay of religious tension either which you do see in some countries in africa which yeah. uh, i think most but most people ignore but it is actually quite important because it, it kind of not not just and i'm so i shouldn't say just religion but tribal tensions as well like certainly when i was working in um south sudan you know you had these different sort of tribal sense really funny thing to say but you know tribal tensions you know for power effectively you know who's who tribe with the right to lead the country make decisions create the laws etc it's a it's a very sort of Namibia, a very gentle country. So this isn't an advert for Namibia, although it is a fantastic place. We're here to talk about the rest of the world too. So um, let, let's sort of bounce into bounce into some other countries in, uh, well, around the world. Let's, uh, let's have a look at this. This is the uranium cost curve, and thanks to um, JP Morgan for this. Um, it's, it basically shows where all of the different mines um, around the world sit on the cost curve. And as you can see, it's very clear when you look at this that all of the ones in Kazakhstan, which are ISR and ISL, are on the lower end of the cost curve. Cigar Lake's in the middle. That's probably because the grades are just so high. Um, but it's got it's got some very technical mining uh, techniques. Um, and then you've got Husab and, and Rossing sitting at the at the top end of the co cost curve. So it's interesting to note. Um, doesn't really matter now any anyway because the uranium price is getting above these prices. So. Um, Good to see, though. Well, yeah. Well, I say money, money cures all else. Um, it, it, it seems so, certainly in this space. And um, so, with with regards to um, it, again that price, we, we you know, but maybe you and I and, and lots of people agree that obviously I think uranium price, certainly on the spot price. I don't know what's happening in the contracting space. Is sort of moving creatively up towards that hundred dollar mark, uh, where projects which would have, you know, two two years ago, well, quite frankly, one year ago, not been a viable prospect. Um, now look like they potentially what will be able to be able to make money and therefore get funded and therefore maybe start the process of moving through that kind of the the, the economic study phases so um is that, that that's going to help but is it is it sustainable do we will we see these violent moves that we do in some other, other commodities or is the demand just too strong look i think the demand is very strong um i think you're going to you're going to need more uranium than what we can even imagine coming onto the market for the demand that we're about to see. So, um, you know, I, I I would argue that there is a space for all projects to be developed at this point in time. Right. Okay. Well, we're... and for further exploration and discoveries. Of course, <laughs> of course. Look, top right, folks. Top right. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> okay, well, okay. So that that, that that's kind of helps us understand the kind of you know where 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 projects and even kind of jurisdictions sit in terms of that cost curve. Obviously, heavily skewed on the left towards uh, ISL, IS, ISL, so in situ leaks or in situ recovery stuff, versus kind of the sort of um, other kind of maybe open pit under underground projects elsewhere in the world. Okay, good, good, good. Anything else we need to know there? Nope, that's it. We'll go on to this okay. slide. So thank you, Bannerman. On Bannerman. Namibia again. <laughs> right, so okay. We're going to Namibia first, and then we're going to go through um, Australia and Canada and okay. end, end with Kazakhstan. Um, I'll probably focus on the things that I know more about. Um, so Kazakhstan will get the least amount of time. Um, but look, let's have a look at this map. You can see Rossing here. So Rossing has been a mine, as I said, for many, many years. It was owned by Rio Tinto for a very long time, and it was only recently sold to uh, CNNC in 2021. Um, that is only five kilometres from Husab. In fact, Husab's original name was Rossing South. Um, uh, it was a bit of a marketing ploy when it was first discovered, um, but we decided to rename it after the mountain range that goes along the side of there. So that's the name Husab. Um, and, and the two companies were actually talking at one point about doing a potential joint development of these projects. So that was quite interesting. Um, there, was, there was talk about um, sort of putting a chairlift or a lift going across between Husab and Rossing um uh to to get the ore mined over in Rossing so that was something that was discussed obviously when projects are nearby there's synergies so you'll always look at m a around those certain areas um the other funny thing was Rio Tinto used to have picnics at Husab for many many years and never thought to put a drill hole there so it took someone like uh our team at Extract to come along stick a drill hole in and Bang, there's the, the biggest deposit in the world or one of them. So 500 million pounds of uranium at Husa, but can't understate how large that deposit is. It's absolutely massive. And, of course, Paladin's Langer Heinrich was in production during the last cycle. They're about to restart production there. Um, and you've got Tubus, obviously. Um, uh, and, and, of course, Itango, which is highlighted here because this is Bannerman's slide. So Itango is one of those projects um, which could – you know, be developed during this cycle, um, which would be great for, for Bannerman. Um, obviously, this is really a, a leverage program, to, a project to the uranium price because it's very low grade, but it's quite large. Um, so, so that's the good thing about that. Now, of course, Truck Copy is also in here, and you can see they had a little bit of production at one point at Truck Copy. So Truck Copy was famously sold during the last uranium cycle for a some extraordinary amount of money like in the billions and um, unfortunately the grade never worked out in that project so um, it's uh, sort of been sitting there um, and not but it done. hasn't gone away it comes back to our point about if we spent the the price that you can get for uranium will incentive will be, will be the incentive as to whether or not people can think they can go back in there and of course as a banker I'm thinking well will the price stay there if I'm going to lend money that I gotta believe that the price will remain high. Um, that demands will outstrip supply. Um, so, to projects like that, no matter how low, low grade, you know, could get into production if we can. If you can show bankers that there's sustained pricing. But you know, for me, my banking days, I would have said, okay, I need to see prices um, at a certain level for at least three years. That's but what I'm I need gonna, to I'm believe. I'm going to say that assumes you're going to go to a banker for the funding, right? Because there's lots of other ways that you can fund these projects. Um, you can okay, fund like off-take agreements through partnership arrangements, um, part equity. You know, there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, so, well, on the equity on the equity side, that I think that's the bit I'm kind of focused in on. Like, obviously, debt in terms of off offtake or strategic um, money from people with big balance sheets is fine. But if there's any component of equity, I, that's certainly what I would I would be asking for is like sustained pricing. So. Yeah. I, I guess uh, yeah, these, these are different times. These are different times potentially. So that, therefore, maybe there's alternative financing around, which one is less dilutory if you're a public company, um, and two, you know, may not cost as much if it's coming from a strategic uh, investor, like, i.e., a, a state-owned entity. Yeah. So we shall Would see what that an looks interesting like. Interesting time ahead. That's for sure. Look, this is a slide from Extracts. Um, 
extracts old sort of presentation many years ago. So this is from 2012, but I just thought it was kind of interesting because what it does is it shows the deposits. Now, some of these might've grown, some of them might've shrunk, but it shows the deposit sizes and you can see the larger the deposit, the higher it up, higher up it is on the graph. So obviously HUSAB is just massive compared to everything else. But basically, you have the grades as well. So Langer Heinrich is really an outlier in terms of where it, where the grade sits in in Namibia. It's quite high grade for the Namibian deposits. Um, Rossing's obviously getting a bit lower, and then of course a tango, which we've just been talking about, is down here, and Copy is, you know, sort of further back. So, um, so that's it. Just but just looking at this, like you know, for instance, like you know, just talking to people in, in the industry, things like Langer Heinrich was obviously Paladin's um, project now. Um, is, you know, they high-graded the purchases out of that back then. So in terms of the, the grace today, 10, 11, nearly 12 years on, um, is that is that a challenge for people like that or does it just kind of fall back into the pack, as it were, in terms of the, the, the grades? I think if they're super low-grade, it could be a challenge. <laughs> um, so you have to have a bit of grade in, in there to make it work. Um, uh, but... Uh, Look, I'm not, I'm not a processing expert. It's really outside my area of, of expertise, so I'm not going to comment too much about it. Um, but there's certainly okay. ways to upgrade these things. Okay, okay. Um, right, and so, so what's, the, what's the takeaway from this? I mean, it's 2012. I mean, th things will have changed, like, I guess. So well, don't read too much into this. Well, it just basically shows they're all pretty low-grade in Namibia, but they do work, right? Yeah, Ross okay. Ross working, you got Langer Heinrich working, you got Husap working. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. And this... Whoa, that's... look at that thing. <laughs> Is this your big, ugly baby? <laughs> I tell you what, I was nicknamed the daughter of Husab by the Chinese after they purchased this mine, um, which is kind of sweet. So thank you to all the guys at CGMPC for that. Um, but this is, look, this is fantastic. This is, we had 20 drill rigs on site trying to delineate this resource Um and the aim of the game was to get the resource as big as possible so that we could it would assist us in the sale process and the feasibility, right? So obviously everyone knows that you need an indicated resource to run a feasibility over that resource. And, um, you know, the bigger the resource, the better the economics look, right? So 20 drill rigs going like the absolute clappers um, on that project. And you can see here, it's a very, it's a very deep pit. Um, uh, it's a big pit, so basically there's a pit one and a pit two. I don't know whether the, both pits have been built yet, but when they are both in operation, it will be bigger than the um, Kalgoorlie super pit, if anyone's ever seen that. Um, so pretty yeah. massive cool. um, and uh, impressive in scale. That, that, that really is, because I was looking at, when I was in Namibia actually, um, I promise you folks it's not a Namibia show, but it is, it's starting to sound like it, is... Um, is the when I was looking at the I was on the Bannerman um, site and then went back with it and had a presentation from their team. But the, the size of these pits and then when you kind of get, you don't really understand until you're standing there yeah. looking at the ground, uh, the extent of it, you know, like you know, one one and a half kilometers wide by one kilometer, and then it just goes down and down and down. It's it's, it's a kind of for Namibia, it's kind of earth-moving exercise. It's an engineering exercise yeah. of you know efficiencies in terms of how you process this this rock in the, in, in, in the best possible way. That you know those, those small percentages matter down yeah. down at that level, but it works. It does work. It does work exactly. But, okay, we're going to move to Australia now. <laughs> Yay! You, yeah, hey, hang on. Can I can I just say? So I was born in Australia. Were you, were you born in Australia? I was actually born in Australia. I was born in born Sydney. Here. You're born in Sydney? Yeah. Get you. I never Get ever you. thought I'd live in Perth, but there you go. <laughs> so there you go. Right, go on then. Right, what are we looking at here? Okay, so what we're looking at is a map of Australia. Now, um, everyone would be familiar with our anti-nuclear stance in Australia, um, thanks to the Labor Party and the Greens. Um, but basically, they've, um, throughout Australia, brought in a lot of exploration and mining moratoriums um, around, you know, uranium mining. So, for example, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria are total no-go zones. Um, uh, the Northern Territory is 50-50. So part of the Northern Territory, the uranium mines are in Kakadu National Park. They can never be mined. 
South Australia is extremely uranium mining friendly. So this is basically where um, our current existing two mines operate. Um, so we've got the Beverly mine and we've got Olympic Dam. Beverly is an ISR project and Olympic Dam, of course, is that massive copper gold project, which has so much uranium in it as well, but it's a byproduct, right? So um, so that that that's about 9 million pounds coming out of Olympic Dam. Um, and of course, Honeymoon is soon to start. So that is right there. Shout out to Boss um, and Duncan at Boss, who is very busy trying to get this back into production. And I think he'll he'll be uh, very successful in that. Um, so looking forward to seeing another mine up and running in Australia very soon. And then we've got the Northern Territory here. So the Northern Territory has an interesting history. So Narbalek was a 20 million pound uranium deposit that was mined in a month. So mined and stockpiled and all done in a month. You had Ranger, that was owned by Rio Tinto ERA. Um, and that was basically mined for, again, many, many years. Um, it now has a one and a half billion dollar price tag for rehab over it. It's right on the edge of the Kakadu National Park. And then, of course, you have Javaluka, which is really one of the most beautiful looking um, uranium deposits in the world. And that... Um, just to give you some context, has 313 million pounds of uranium in it and uh, will never be mined. Well, it, it, you know, I, this, this is the thing that I'm learning about, about mining as I go along. I think I've seen, and we're bouncing around a few jurisdictions here, which is great, but, you know, as I, as I have for the past many years, too many years, um, look at these various jurisdictions, you, you do have these kind of political risk situations of, you know, South America in terms of you know, social, social engineering and, so, social distrust. Um, you, you've got uh, First Nations issues uh, you know, in, in North America more, more broadly. And when people say never, I think it's a, I think it's a funny thing because it will eventually, because we're going to need this stuff eventually. And I think as we've seen with uranium specifically, um, political change is inevitable when something is needed, not wanted, needed. And I think the energy crisis has, you know, led politicians to perhaps reevaluate what their vote-winning strategies uh, look like. And so we've seen in Europe go from, you know, kind of slight distrust and disdain for nuclear as a solution through to this is now critical to our energy cost crisis, which we've we're still we're still got over here. Energy prices are still high. It wasn't just a uh, sort of a, a, a figment of our imagination during COVID. It's still here. Yeah. Um, so I, it'll be interesting when you say some things will never be mined. I, I suspect in our I lifetime we'll right. see some of these um, but, some of these things mined. But political but change is needed. agreement from the traditional owners in the area um, who yeah. at the moment have said absolutely never in their lifetime. Um, so, uh, you know, people change and decisions change. So we'll wait and see. But what I can changes. say is around Narbalek is where DevEx have their projects and they've been drilling some really good uranium there. It's also unconformity uranium, so very similar to what they've got in the Athabasca Basin. And they've been drilling very similar stuff to us, um, the DevEx uh, team. So um, just a shout out to the DevEx team. Obviously, um, Yurali and Kintyre are both owned by Cameco. So I don't know if you knew that. Wow. Um, I did not know that. Down in Australia. Why was there it? There you go. So there, there's some pretty significant amounts of uranium in those two deposits. Um, and, of course, Mulga Rock, which was just sold to Vimy. Um, so Mulga Rock. Uh, to, d to Deep Yellow from uh, sorry, Vimy, yeah. To Deep Yellow yeah. from Vimy. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, to create a $600 million company, which is now a $900 million company. So well done to them. They've done well out of that transaction. Um, but Mulga Rock has a, has a mining license. There is a three-mine policy in Western Australia, so there can't be any new exploration and there's no ability to have further new mines. And I think uh, a mining license sits with these guys. Um, I think it's yearly. And then um, and then uh, there's also a deposit that is held by Toro as well there, which for some reason uh, isn't on this map. Right. So, okay. yeah, um, so you can see here who, who, who all the owners are and, um, and they're basically your BHPs, your Rio Tintos, um, 
uh, Heathgate Resources, um, which is a privately held company, and Kesa, um, and Boss, of course, which we would know is a listed company, and of course, Cameco, um, you can see here, and Waluna. So Australia's got a lot of uranium. It's just we do. politicians are just making it rather difficult. So what's, what's the mood of the nation? So, so we've seen a few votes where kind of, I think, population is becoming more and more pro uh, nuclear as a solution for clean energy, green energy, um, and, and people are getting educated. Do you still see a lot of that kind of NGO behavior, Greenpeace, you know, perhaps trying to kind of beat that drum of, of, of anti-nuclear still, or, or is, it, is the mood changing? Oh, look, certainly the Greens party over here is very negative on um, nuclear energy, but, um, you know, the, one of the representatives um, for the Teal Independence um, who has recently come out and said, you know, we need to remove this insane uranium nuclear ban that they've got in Australia. So, um, you know, I think times are changing. I, I think Peter Dutton is very pro-nuclear. He's obviously the opposition leader. Um, and and I think it will be a key sort of um, part of the discussion going into the next election in the next 18 months. So certainly okay, you can see it sort of working its way into the discussion in the background we've just obviously got nuclear um submarines uh so it kind of feels ironic that we've got a whole fleet of you know small modular reactors essentially floating around and we've banned nuclear energy in australia doesn't make I know. sense i know but you, you've outsourced the problem to the french haven't you yeah <laughs> so it doesn't it doesn't count i know the 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 kind of the ridiculousness of politicians um it, it, Right. Okay. Here we are. Now we're going over to Canada, which also has a lot of uranium. Yeah. So, so Canada obviously has the highest grade uranium deposits in the world. So I've just put this uranium intercepts sort of chart here. Um, I'm not sure whether you can see this, but you know, the grades yep. are just massive. So F3, Forum, Can Alaska, 92 Energy, of course, which is my company and Baseload. Um, they are all Canadian companies and they're all at the top of the uranium intercepts there. So really they're very, very high grade deposits. Um, the hurricane deposit, you know, had grades up to 70%, like pure black when it comes out of the ground, um, which is pretty nice to see. Um, and, and that, that um, resource, of course, um, uh, which was discovered by one of our directors, Steve Blower, um, has, has an average grade over 20%. So that's pretty amazing. It's pretty incredible. Now, Canada only has two operating uranium mines. Um, uh, they've got Macarth River and Cigar Lake. Uh, Rabbit Lake was in operation until recently, which we can go through. That, of course, is very similar to the GMZ deposit that we're drilling at the moment. We can talk about that in a bit. Um, but there's certainly lots of activity in the Athabasca Basin. It's a great address. And, you know, um, as I've said before, who wouldn't want to be there? Um it's not the only place for uranium in Canada. There, there is also a deposit which is held um, in Labrador called Michelin, which has over a hundred million pounds of uranium, and that is owned by Paladin. Right, and is this that with the Labrador stuff? Is that does that tend to be slightly, slightly different in the sense that it's it's lower grade um, than yeah, you're so sort of seeing here over in Athabasca? It's at the lower end of the grade, so it's um. It's kind of very similar grade, actually, to um, what we're seeing at Gemini, sort of between 0.1 and 0.3%, which is still 3,000 ppm, I should say. So just yeah. to convert mm. everybody's brains here, um, 0.3 is not 300 ppm. It's 3,000 ppm. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and and, and uh, say so in terms of com compared to when we're looking in Africa, you know, the Namibian stuff, that's still significantly higher than that. Absolutely. So your average grade right. at Husab, which is one of the higher grade ones, is is about 450 ppm. Right. Okay. Right. There you go. So, um, yeah. It's a big needs to be beautiful, doesn't it, in, in that case? But yeah. it, it, and it is, and it works, and uranium comes out of the ground, and, and there's, there's money made, and et cetera. Yeah. But uh, Canada is a whole different ball game. Absolutely. It, it would seem. This just shows past production. So obviously MacArthur River um, was shut down during, you know, the period of uh, depressed pricing um, in the uranium market. Um, this is in tons, I should say, uh, tons of U308, which just, just confuse everyone. 
Um, uh, <laughs> um, but it's, I think, about 15 to 20 million pounds at MacArthur River, just um, if you were going to convert it, um, that, that comes out um, of there. And, and of course, um, Cigar Lake has similar figures um, as well. Um, and you can see Rabbit Lake, um, which, as I've said, is very similar looking in terms of grade profile and depth um, and, you know, parallel structures to what we've got at 92 Energies GMZ. So that was in production until 2016 there. Um, so quite a lot of uranium um, that could be produced out of um, Canada. It's about 40 million pounds thereabouts a year when both MacArthur River and Cigar Lake are in full production. Right. And when did, just just on the whole, turn, oh, there's a good picture actually. So, yeah, get crack on. I'll ask the question in a second. Sure. So we're looking at a picture of, of a mine here. We are. Wow. We So I just thought it was interesting to show how different all these mines are around the world. Um, uh, Cigar Lake really is one of the most technical mines in the world. Um, and the reason being is it has to be frozen all, all of the circumference of the mine. Um, it has to be mined robotically because the grades are very high. Um, so it's really technical, this mine. Um, but of course, the grades are so high that it still only sits in the middle of the cost curve, which is insane if you think about it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this, this is the thing. I see when you look at Canada, there's a couple of things spring to mind, which is obviously one is the ability to get, kind of get permits and licenses to actually start building a, a, a mine to be able to get the stuff out of the ground. And then secondly, the kind of technical hurdles, which I think, you know, we spoke to Dave Cates over at Denison and, and I, you know, four years ago, I remember this conversation about, you know, freeze domes and, freeze walls and you know how do you how do you stop water interfering and how do you manage water tables so this this the freezing component is a, bit, a big element and a big concern obviously to first nations so um looks like cigar lake have cracked that and it is doable it's a question of what's the cost of doing that and obviously it's a fact on 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 margins ultimately so well, you, um, do you, what, what what are the challenges in in Canada? Well, you would only need to freeze walls if um if if your deposit is hosted in the sandstone. So there's two different types of deposits. There's the unconformity hosted in the sandstone, um, and then there's the basement hosted deposits. The basement hosted deposits, it's in you know hard competent rock, so it's just traditional mining. The stuff in the sandstone is the porous stuff, right? So that's where you have to freeze your walls. Now, um, I think they're doing ISR um, as well as another mining yeah. technique. So there's new yeah. innovative mining techniques coming into the Athabasca Basin. There's SABAR mining, um, there's ISR mining. So ISR in the Athabasca, I think is an absolute game changer. If they can get that working, which they already have um, through the testing that they've done at Denison's deposits, um, you know, I think that has the ability to make a lot of these smaller deposits um, far more economic, um, but also it's 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 less intrusive than any of this sort of mine building. Um, so it will get you through the permitting process more quickly. I will think I would think an environmental process, etc. So ISL is very exciting, I think, um, and definitely something that i'm looking on the lookout for okay okay so if it's less intrusive but it's less intrusive on the surface i guess there's there's still challenges um underground and you know big up the or certainly that you know conversations with dallas and they, they've still got a lot to kind of prove um they feel they can go they are going through the phases and they will be able to kind of come out the other side um with with that so, so and i just i think it's always important to kind of deal with some of the every jurisdiction has, has its own challenges you know, yeah, Africa is kind of quick in terms of permits and and, and, and licensing, etc. But you're dealing with a low grade component and maybe the skill shortage component, and, and water. Uh, you know, and, and 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 well, lack of water, lack of because uh, the it, de, de, desalination, <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah. plants required, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Australia has its own you know, like political uh, challenges, and that you know, that's as, that's as, and you know, that's before we can get into permitting and licensing, etc. Athabasca, Athabasca, lot of water. We're looking at something there, and it's it's it's, it's for, there's a lot of mines, not just uranium, uh, suffer from this this water uh, challenge. So yeah. it's interesting. It's not mining's not easy, is it? No, it's not <laughs> easy at all. But that's why we love it. It's so dynamic. Nothing is the same. Yeah. Every deposit is different. Every commodity is different. That's what makes it a great great 
industry to work in and shout uh, out to all future women out there get into it well 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 done <laughs> well done you <laughs> we, if only the wor- world was run by women with We'd have less wars, yeah. I suspect. Um, less wars and more organized uh, if, if my house also <laughs> needs to go by. Right, okay. So uh, what are we going to look at next? Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Now, this, of course, is the area that I know least about. But, of course... Oh, don't worry. Um, I got gotcha. you. It represents I've been there. I've worked 41% there. of the world's uranium. Um, yeah. Uh, so they use ISR. They um, basically, at the moment, um, they create their own acid um, uh, to do that process. Um, uh, they have 26 deposits, um, which are grouped into 14 asset clusters. Um, and, and they have lots of JVs and um, and subsidiaries and, and different people working with them. So obviously Cameco. Um, they own 40% of the Inkai joint venture. Um, uh, there's obviously some joint ventures with um, the Russians on some of these projects as well. Um, and yeah, so um, sort of they've kind of come from nowhere. They were not producers of uranium until sort of 2000 or so, I think is the first production that they started. Um so they've really come and really changed the way the market works quite substantially. And of course, as I said, they're at the low end of the cost curve, although the lower hanging fruit is starting to be picked. Absolutely. And and, and I think some of the uh, constraints that they set upon themselves in terms of you know, production levels, et cetera, um, I, I'm wondering how that, that will change as the pressure from Russia, the pressure from China influences, yeah, obviously with various, various agreements being recently signed and okay. so a lot of this uranium U three hundred eight is going east now. Um, Absolutely, huge amount. Like you would have seen the f- um, that they had to do a, a special meeting um, to approve more than fifty percent of um, their uranium going to the Chinese. So um, that that says a lot. Um, it says a lot for how much demand is coming out of China. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of uranium that's heading that way. Um, there, there is a bit of a problem. It's been tough transporting uranium out of Kazakhstan into the Western world recently. Um, and you would have seen um, there was a bizarre article um, that came and flashed across everyone's screen saying that it was actually going to get banned out of um, St. Petersburg. Um, so the, the movement of that was going to get banned, but it was withdrawn very quickly, very rapidly, that statement. Um but it does show that there is, you know, a few pressure points around, you know, getting getting um, the Kazakh material to the Western utilities. Um, so, uh, you know, we are seeing, I think, the start of bifabrication of the market. Yeah, I, I, well, I, well, absolutely, absolutely, and uh, the, the, and the knock-on effects and the ramifications of that are are, are huge. Um, certainly, when we kind of introduce kind of the enrichment um, side of things as as well, it rolls out um, um, in terms of their, I say, close ties with 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 Kazakhstan and and indeed Russia's close ties with Kazakhstan. It's so long been held by the North American um, uranium producers and wannabe producers that that this was a problem um, in the making, and and I guess it's kind of borne out to be true in the last last year or so um, in terms of where where that uranium is actually going to end up and what that's going to do for prices in the in the West. So it, it's kind of helped. Pricing certainly helped companies like yourself, I, I, I suspect, uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, so, not not all bad. Um, you would have right, seen that so production w- increased recently. Um, for yeah. twenty twenty five, it's increased now to the hundred percent that they can actually produce under the rules over there. Yeah. But it's fully contracted, so there's no yeah. excess, um, you know, supply running around the market. I think that's really important yeah. for people to note. Um, they ha- they've had to, I think, increase it because people. Ha- People have been flexing up their contracts. So the way the uranium contracts work is I think there's a flex clause in most of those contracts which allows them to, you know, increase the amount of uranium that they request. And everyone has obviously said we want it all. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Just something interesting to note, I think. And I think that says a lot. Oh, for sure. So that's just just what um, ISR looks like. It's not much to look at yeah. really. I oh, know it's like say it's, it's not it's kind of like non well it kind of just looks like a field, isn't it? Yeah, it does. 
we're not compared to that that you know compared to the fish you just showed us where it's kind of it sort of takes over a bit so yeah what's yeah. the white building in one day i do not know do not know what's in there some sort of processing or something maybe they store the acid in there right no, no. there we go <laughs> good okay Right. Well, that is about it from me. Um, unless you've got any more questions. Or- no, that's that's kind of, it's, it's kind of good. You know what I, what I liked about that was it showed there are different types of mines, different sorts of challenges per jurisdiction. There's in some places there's a lot of uranium. We just kind of you know politicians need to kind of get out of the way of themselves and and, and let people do this in a responsible, considered manner. And obviously, all of that we didn't talk about ESG or social license or any of that good stuff, but that. That is kind of critical, and you can sort of see why because some some of these these mine sites are just vast and take over the land. You know, and these pits are super pits, and some people may consider them an ice, or you know, others may consider uh, be considering so what, what sort of damage is doing to water tables, etc. So, it, mining has I, got to be held accountable, and I think it is upping its game. Um, but we do need this stuff, so um, I thank you things of a rock around the world and uh, we're going to see you soon you're, you're going to become a, a, a regular well i hope so i hope people have enjoyed this and that they get something out of it it really is a beginner's guide um so uh, to air shattering in it but um i very much enjoyed doing it for you so i hope everyone else enjoys listening i'm sure that sure they have and i say for beginner's guide to appreciate you know you know some of the aspects um that you know uranium has, has got to get, get through and what we need to know it's really really important uh so siobhan Thank you. Go have yourself a wonderful weekend. Thanks a lot. Bye.